Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Vietnam War. I'm Mike B, and today we're going to be doing a video that a bunch of you have been asking me to do. So I figured out a way to kind of do it. Um, it's going to be basically going through the small arms and like firearms and stuff that uh, the Army, Air Force, Navy, and uh, Marines infantry kind of used. This is not going to be con uh, unconventional forces like Special Forces, Navy SEALs, all that stuff, or um, the PJs in the Air Force, it's not going to be any of that. This is just like the main weapons that were used from like 1959 um, till, or 1963 rather, until 1975. So I'll kind of go through, I'm going to try to make this quick. There's a lot of them, um, but I'll just kind of spend a little bit of time on each one, explain a bit about them, and then I'm going to have pictures popping up right here. Or somewhere around here in the background after I go through and because uh, I, I don't own and I can't own most of these weapons because they're select fire but um, I own like one or two like civilian variants of these and that's it so um, anyway we're gonna go through and I'm gonna have to use pictures but uh, keep donating to the channel and we can change that I can get a bunch of class 3 stuff and make actual videos and show you how to go out and use these things but highly doubtful Anyway, we'll get started here. Right, so the first and foremost rifle we're going to talk about for U.S. forces in Vietnam is the M14 Select Fire Battle Rifle. Now, if you don't know about this, I'll probably do an individual video on this as well because it's got its own little history and it's so loved and well-liked by everybody except for most of the soldiers who had to use it in the early days of Vietnam. Um, the reason they didn't like it is because it was a 7.62 by 51 millimeter rifle that was fully automatic capable and the rate of fire was so intense and... The recoil system wasn't, you know, made for that kind of, you know, fast fire. That had become uncontrollable. It was heavy. They couldn't carry enough rounds to compete with the AK-47s, you know, fire superiority. So that was kind of the reason that um, it was then replaced by the next series of rifles we're going to talk about. But, uh, yeah, the M14 was used the entire way through. Um, there were some sniper variants of that, which will be a whole separate video as well. And... Um, yeah, so you got the M14 used by Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, Navy forces. And uh, although it was used all the way through, not as much as you would think. So, all right, so 1963, the uh, military started experimenting with, with what would become the most common rifle used in Vietnam by most forces, and that's going to be the M16. Now, the M16 was the Air Force, like, Model 601, 602, something like that. I don't know. I don't exactly know the model numbers that the Air Force used, but basically what it was in a nutshell was the original M16 was like the one I have. It's a slick side. There's no, um, there's no shell, uh, what do you call it, deflector, and then there's no forward assist on the receiver. The Army saw a need for the forward assist big time, so they mandated that, or they pretty much demanded that if we're going to be buying all these, we're going to have a forward assist on them. And even though Eugene Stoner Colt and um, a bunch of the other people were like, oh, it's pretty unnecessary. Well, we later find out that it really wasn't. But anyway, so what that covers is two rifles that were adopted in 1963, 1964, somewhere around there. Um, we have the M16, right, which is the Air Force model, whatever, slick side. And then you have the XM16E1, right? So that's the one that's going to look just like the slick side, except with a forward assist, right? So they're not going to have the um, shell deflector or anything. And they both have the three-prong flash hider. There were some really early ones, like really early for the Air Force. that had a weird flash hider, but essentially they looked almost the same. Um, I'll do another video on like the actual variants of the M16 itself for the sake of time. So we got the uh, M16 and the M16, XM16E1. Yes, God. And then, yes, the only difference between those two is the forward assist. So when they figured out that, you know, there was a lot of rounds getting stuck in the chamber and not chambering all the way and the forward assist was a necessary thing and that there was a lot of fouling and stuff that happens, they started figuring out that they needed to chrome line the chamber and the bore. And then they came out with the M16A1 that we know it at. In 1967, this happened and they did that and it saw quite a drastic um, improvement on performance and reliability. So. 1967 is when the actual M16A1 came out, and most of those are going to have, they'll have a forward assist, and they'll have the, what we, we call the birdcage flash hider. It's not going to be the three-prong anymore, because it was prone to get caught on stuff. So that's what you're going to see. The M16A1 is the one that went through Desert Storm and all that stuff. Um, now, that being said, both the M16 and the XM16A1 were used throughout the entire conflict. So you're going to see them popping up everywhere. You see guys in 1972 with a slick side M16. 
So, and then kind of shooting off of that, in 1966, there was kind of this little project for, um, I, I think basically what it, what it adds up to me, sorry I'm rubbing my face, I got a lot of cat hair floating around and itching. What it, what it kind of sounds like to me is somebody wanted a carbine version or in length of the M16 for like unconventional forces, but it was still used by conventional forces throughout. NCOs, some officers and whatever would carry them, and it's called the XM177. Now, same thing with the uh, M16 is the XM177 was kind of an Air Force project, right? It had a big flash hider on the front, big long one, um, because of the big muzzle blast you get when you cut down the barrel on any weapon that's made to shoot a rifle cartridge. And the Air Force didn't care about the forward assist and the Army demanded it, so the XM77E1 is the Army's variant. It looks like it's the CAR-15, the CAR-15. And it's got the aluminum butt stock that folds in and all that stuff. So you, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. That's where the M4 basically came from. So it's a lot much shorter. It's like, I think it's like 24 inches or something like that. And so the Air Force was the XM-177 and the Army's are the XM-177E1. That's going to be the little carbon thing. Pretty sweet. If you ever watch Platoon, that's what uh, Barnes carries. Or, yeah, he carries one and Elias carries one. So that's what they look like. All right, now we're getting into the earlier stuff, but here's the weapons that we're seeing all the way through. So we've got the M1 and M2 carbines. I'm gonna lump these into the one thing for the sake of time. M1 carbine is semi-automatic, M2 carbine is select fire. That's really the only difference. There's a little bit more to it, but that's essentially what you need to know for this video. So both these weapons were used throughout the entire war. We tried to supply most of the South Vietnamese Army and the Republic of Korea uh, military with the M1 and M2 carbines. Um, but we still use them throughout. And you can see the little shorty versions for tunnel rats and stuff like that. And some of those were unconventional, but we'll talk about that in the unconventional weapon video. But they literally cut them down to just be like this big so they could use them. So, um, yeah, you got the M1 and the M2 carbine. M2 carbine, it's got a really fast little rate of fire, but they said that the, apparently the knockdown power and all that stuff wasn't going to cut it. And that's why they went with the M16. So, But you do see that used by U.S. forces through 1975. Now you've got, we'll get into some cool stuff, the M3 grease gun. A lot of you guys are asking me about this, did they use them? Yes, vehicle crews were issued grease guns up until the mid-1990s. Um, the unit I was in, in uh, the Wisconsin Guard, was a mechanized unit until 1998, and they had grease guns in there until 1998, in their 113s and their Bradleys and stuff. So, very interesting. Yeah, uh, armored crews were issued them in case they had to bail out. Um, the guy that I was talking about that was a tanker, he said he was issued one, but he grabbed a hold of an M16, so if they had to bail out, it, they weren't totally screwed at distance. Um, grease gun's really good at within about 100 yards, and past that, good luck. So it's a submachine gun, it's not made for that. But they were used quite frequently, you see a lot of pictures. Uh, they were also captured a lot, but we're going to go over an entirely separate video for the Vietnamese stuff. Um, that's going to probably take like three segments of the videos to talk about. Um, so you got the M3 grease gun that was used throughout. Now you've also got, people have been asking me this too, is the Thompson. The main model that I've seen in Vietnam is the M1 or the M1A1. So it's the World War II variant, World War II slash Korea variant. And um, I don't know why, but these things keep popping up in pictures all the way through. Just when you think it's like an early thing, you, you look and there's a guy in Way City carrying one that he removed the buttstock from. Probably for, you know, CQC, uh, close quarters stuff, which is smart. But it's like you see these things popping up and they still use the 45 caliber cartridge, which was still a uh, main cartridge of the... United States military. So yeah, the Thompson submachine gun was used in Vietnam, but probably not in the numbers you'd expect it, but nevertheless, it was still there. It was also used by a lot of South Vietnamese. That was kind of the thing is Kennedy in 1963 was trying to dump all these old obsolete weapons, um, the Thompson being one, to the South Vietnamese military, but we ended up using them, so that's probably how they popped up. And you could buy them. Uh, some guys have told me that you could buy them from some Vietnamese guys for like a personal weapon. Pretty cool. Um, now in the early days, and then again, <clears throat> we kind of transit, transfer them to the South Vietnamese, the Browning Automatic Rifle, the BAR 1918A2, the World War II variant, uh, was used very early on as kind of the squad automatic weapon in some cases, and then they figured out that one of the weapons we're gonna be talking about actually next was far superior to it, so it didn't really see a lot of service past like 1964 or 65. You, you might see a picture. The South Vietnamese loved them, and they used them, and the Republic of Korea guys loved them, but. We used them very early on and then it was easily replaced by the M60 general purpose machine gun. So in 1957, this thing was adapted as our light machine gun to replace like the 1919 A4 and A6s and all that stuff. Anyway, the, the big 30 caliber machine gun, it was designed and implemented to replace that. It's uh, 
pretty good weapon. We used it. I mean, there's still some being used in some capacities today on helicopters and stuff like that. So the M60 was like one of the iconic things of the Vietnam War. They're called the pig because, it, I mean, it's 23 and a half pounds. It sucks to carry, but it's better than a 240 Bravo for all you Vietnam vets. Yes, I will have a competition with you on the comfort level. But anyway, um, the M60, 23 and a half pounds, great medium and light machine gun. Um, it was used very effectively, as you can see from pictures and stuff. Uh, right here, you can see that guy carrying it on his shoulder. And... Um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting, interesting weapon. I don't know what more to say about it. It's just, you guys probably know more about it than I do. It's a great machine gun. It's like 800 rounds per minute was the firing rate. Pretty reliable most of the time. That's what I've heard from many people in videos, interviews. So that was the main medium and light machine gun that was used by US forces throughout Vietnam. So now we get into some fun stuff and we only got a few left, so bear with me. We've got, in 1961, we, sort of realize that there's a need to be able to reach out and touch someone with a, with a grenade and be able to fire a grenade. So it came out with the uh, M79 grenade launcher. It's a break action, single shot, 40 millimeter grenade launcher and it can fire a series of different cartridges and stuff. This was um, loved and hated just like the M60 by a bunch of for US forces. And um, the Vietnamese didn't like them because they, <laughs> like they had RPGs, but um, the Americans could in a, in a small contained firefight where an RPG might not be too practical, they could send a grenade over and take out a little position and, you know, the sound of it is scary and everything. So that was, uh, it's called the thump gun because the sound is kind of like a hollow thunk. So, yeah, we'll eventually be making videos on all these individual weapons. But, so the M79 was the main grenade launcher from, you know, 1961 until the end and they were used afterwards and stuff. So, and then in 1969, um, they came out with the M203 grenade launcher, which is what just got phased out by the M320 or 327. I don't know. I don't know what it's called. They were just getting it when I was getting out, so I don't remember. Um, but I've carried a 203. They're really cool. They're really heavy, but they work great. Compact. They fit on the bottom of an M16 or an M4. And yeah, Colt manufactured them. I think some other people did maybe, but who knows. Anyway, those were introduced in 69, so you don't really start seeing those pop up until about 70, through like 73, and they're still in very limited numbers. They had to get a new, you know, heat shield for the M16. Nice big conversion, but it was very effective because then your Grenadier didn't have to carry a sidearm, which is what we're going to talk about, you know, next. Or not next. After all this, we're going to go through the sidearm because there was really only one um, issued and widely, widely used. But then they didn't have to carry a sidearm. They had a rifle, so you've got a rifle and a Grenadier. In the same one so that's that was the concept behind that and that's why we used it still today so for anti-tank and anti-bunker anti-position vehicle whatever you name it we had the m72 law light a light anti-tank weapon i gotta slow down all right light anti-tank weapon it's a 66 millimeter rocket launcher the norwegians designed it and manufactured it and then someplace in arizona started manufacturing it in limited numbers single use um very small compact launcher and this was a very widely used thing. You see a lot of pictures of guys carrying them, a lot of people using them. Um, it was adapted by the US in 1963 to replace the, whatever they had, the super bazooka or something like that. I mean, other weapons were used, but this was probably the, the main one used by infantry forces, um, American and South Vietnamese in Vietnam. So it's a really cool weapon. You see some pictures of it right here popping up and uh, you'll probably recognize it. I think in Forrest Gump, he was carrying one or somebody else was carrying one. So for movie reference, very commonly used to take out like bunkers and stuff like that. Now we get to the, the fun one and then we'll get to the, the sidearm at the end that kind of ties everything together. The M2A1-7 flamethrower. It was still used in Vietnam and then they, I think they were outlawed in 1978 or something like that by the Geneva Conventions because they're just disgusting. I mean, I don't know why we have laws on how we should kill people. It doesn't make sense, but that's a whole other argument. But anyway, yeah, so these things were used in Vietnam to take out tunnels bunkers and stuff like that pretty much the same thing that they were used for in the south pacific and in korea and uh in europe in world war ii they were just used in a lesser capacity in the european theater they were also used to uh, torch villages that were harboring or supporting Viet Cong and north vietnamese forces which is what you can see in this picture not exactly cool but hey it's war it's not gonna be pretty um so that was used widely in that capacity as well now the sidearm it's pretty obvious what it is and it was the issued one and freaking been in service since 1911 the Colt model 1911 a1 so you can see just about every soldier that's got a sidearm is going to have this in Vietnam because that was the issued weapon 45 caliber 
seven round magazine, you guys know it's a 1911. It's the most common thing. I'm sure people privately purchased handguns and stuff like that and used them if they could get ammo for them. But the actual issued firearm was going to be the, the Colt Model 1911, or just 1911, I guess, because a bunch of other people made them. Okay, hopefully this video is not like 30 minutes long. I'm trying to just blast through all these. But these are going to be the main weapons that were used by U.S. forces in Vietnam. Uh, the most commonly, widely used, issued. And uh, yeah, so stay tuned for future videos on like unconventional U.S. forces, Viet Cong, North Vietnamese Army, you name it. Because those, those are going to take a long time. The U.S. is pretty straightforward. They, they tried to keep their weapons pretty simple. And, you know, they, they issued them out. So they had, you know less of a variety, we'll say. But uh, yeah, anyway, so that's what the US forces used. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification bell and uh, keep up with this series. This is really fun to do. And I appreciate all the questions and stuff. And yes, you guys are nagging me. Eventually I'll get to everything, as you can see. Um, so yeah, just, just keep on with the uh, positive comments and stuff like that, and I'll get to your question eventually. So. Yeah, and then also consider supporting the channel. Like I said, the stuff, um, if I want to actually get some of the stuff to show you guys and do field tests and um, things like that and kind of show you what they are and not just a picture. Uh, every donation helps to the channel. I do have a job, so you don't have to don't have to be like, good at job, stop internet begging. I'm not. I'm just saying, if you guys want to see more stuff, you guys know how to do it. You can donate, and then I will take those funds and use it to make the channel cooler. If not, I'm totally fine with that too. I can do either way, but um, that's why I kind of asked that just for clarification because I know it's just a matter of time before somebody says, stop begging. But anyway, the link to that's in the description. You can do it directly. So um, yeah, other than that, thanks for watching everybody. I appreciate it. Let me know what you think of the comments and I, I, I might have missed a few weapons, maybe, possibly. These are literally all the ones I can think of. Um, we'll get into shotguns in another video too. I totally forgot about that, spaced that out. So we'll get into shotguns because there's actually a huge list of those that were used by U.S. forces. And I'll do that in a separate video. This is already a long video, but this is going to get the majority and the big chunk of uh, weapons out of the way. So thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you on the next video.